Hello and welcome to this video on unifying substitutions in logic, which is also going to be relevant to type systems and computer science. So previously we looked at substitutions, here is an example where we've got some kind of set of mappings which we call a substitution, and then we can apply that uh, and get some result. What we're looking at today is unifying substitutions, and a substitution is said to unify two values if when applied to both it results in equal results. In mathematical syntax, it might look like this. So when we apply a substitution capital S on A, uh, we get the same result as when we apply that substitution on B. So let's have a look at an exercise. Um, we might have this substitution which maps R to Y, S to Y, and D to S. And we have strings A is red and B is yes. And the question we're trying to answer is, does S unify A and B? So to answer that, we're gonna find out what happens when we apply the substitution to both A and B respectively. Well, when we apply it to A, that's applying it to red, where we've got the R goes to Y, the D goes to S, um, and so we end up with the string yes. When we apply it to B, well, we've got the S goes to Y, um, and we end up with a string yay. Um, so actually, these are different. S A is not equal to S of B. Uh, so here, capital S is not a unifying substitution of A and B. Let's look at this from a slightly different angle. So if we have the same strings, red and yes, what substitution might unify these two strings, unify A and B? So we're looking for some kind of substitution. One such substitution could be R to Y and D to S. In this case, when we apply that substitution both to A and B, uh, we get the string yes. Realistically, this is just turning the string A into B. Uh, we're not actually mapping anything within B. We're just using that R to Y and D to S in red to turn it into yes. We can do the similar thing the other way around. So actually we could do Y to R and S to D. I would map both of them to red. We could do a mix of them. So we could do Y to R, D to S, and we get res. Um, lots of different options here, really. And the point this shows is that a unifying substitution isn't necessarily unique. Also, it doesn't have to map to one of the two or kind of a mix of the two. We can map to something completely different. So for example, if we mapped both the R and Y to Z, and S to D, we get a unifying substitution uh, with Z. Usually, we won't want to do this. Often, we want to find the substitution with the least mappings. Uh, we call the substitution the most general unifier, or the most general unifying substitution, or MGU. This is particularly useful when we look at type systems, um, and we want to minimize the number of extra constraints we're adding uh, when we want to unify uh, different type expressions. We'll get to all that later, though. Let's have a look at another exercise. Uh, in this case, we're going to say we can only map symbols to expressions, so we're kind of limiting what our substitutions can do, just for the sake of understanding how we can apply this new concept of a unifying substitutions to expressions with structures. So, for example, if we have a is 3 and b is y, well, the only actual valid unifying substitution here is y is 3. Why can't we do 3 is y? Well, we said it has to go from symbols to expressions, um, so 3 is an expression uh, and not a symbol, y is a, a symbol um, or kind of variable, how you, how you want to see it. So here, yeah, when we apply the substitution s on a and b, we just get 3. Um, let's have a look at another example, this time with a bit more structure. So again, here we can see we've got 3 plus open brackets 7 times z, and then y plus open brackets x times 2. How do we unify these? Well, we can kind of look at this in columns. Let's, let's start a substitution. Well, this 3 and the y are kind of in the same place, so they should probably map together, so that y has to go to 3. The 7 and the x also are kind of in the same column, so they should map together, so we get x goes to 7. And then lastly, obviously, the z and the 2 go together, just like the last two. Note that this is kind of going the other way as the y and the x, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is overall, when we have the substitution, we apply it to both expressions and we get the same result, right? We get that same 3 plus 7 times 2. And you can see how we've kind of combined these constraints by doing this unification. So for example, we know some places have to be specific numbers, some places are just variables where we might not know them, and we've kind of merged those two statements together and we've got this new expression out. Okay, and on to the next example. This one is just to illustrate that when we say we can go from a variable to expression, uh, that doesn't mean we can just go to a single number or a single thing. An expression can be richer than that. So for example, in this case, well, in fact, we can just have a fairly straightforward substitution of y goes to 3 plus 4. Um, and yes, when you apply the substitution to both, you get the same thing, just 3 plus 4. And on to the next point, uh, we have this one. Uh, so we have 3 plus z is y. 
Well, in this case, there's a few different things we could do. Probably the most simple is we could say that y just maps 3 plus z. So again, this expression can have variables in it. We don't have to eliminate all the variables in our expression when we do a unifying substitution. I know we have in the previous examples, but we don't have to. We could alternatively have a different thing. So for example, we might have y to 3 plus 5 and then z to 5. Um, but again, that wouldn't be our most general unifier, and that's generally what we want to find. Okay, and on to the next one. Uh, in this one, we have a is 3 times 7 and b is 3 plus z. Uh, you'll see that the structures of the expressions are actually different here. So in the top one, we have a uh, multiplication operation. In the bottom one, we have a addition operation. And in fact, because of these different structures, there is no unifying substitution. We can't make these two expressions the same um, while preserving their structure. I mean, maybe semantically, we might be able to say, well, z could be 18. Um, but the point we're trying to make here is if we want to keep the structure, we want to kind of imagine a abstract syntax tree that we're trying to, to match and overlay on each other. Uh, these two just aren't going to overlay on each other because they're fundamentally different operations. So we can see there is no unifying substitution. Next is another weird case. Uh, so here we have a is 1 plus z and b is z. Or if you try and unify these naively, um, you might say, well, this looks a lot like uh, previous things where we've had one thing is just a variable, so we'll just set that to the other stuff. So we might do z goes to 1 plus z. This is wrong, and we'll see why. When we try to apply this substitution onto the two expressions, we get different results. So on a, we get 1 plus 1 plus z, and on b, we get 1 plus z. So uh, if that's wrong, is there a solution? Is this one where we can say there's no solution? Well, actually, there is a solution, at least a theoretical solution, where we can say z is an infinite kind of sum of 1. So it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 forever. And in fact, when we apply this substitution, we get the same thing for both, where they both end up just being 1 plus 1 plus 1 forever. And the reason that this has happened is that we've tried to unify a variable with an expression that contains that variable. We often say this variable occurs in something we're trying to unify it with. Um, and this basically means that you have to end up with an infinitely nested substitution. In some cases, this is okay. Often when we're dealing with type systems and compilers, this isn't okay, simply because computers obviously have finite amounts of memory and don't want to hold all this weird infinite type information. Sometimes this is okay, even in compilers, because we can use clever constructs like lazy loading or represent this in interesting data structures, so that it is okay. Um, so early versions of Prolog would allow this, but most programming languages don't allow infinite types. So we'd usually just raise a type error if we found that we'd end up with an infinite type. And cool, I think that's enough of the examples for now. Let's go back to kind of definitions. So if we think about this unification process, we can represent it as a function. Um, we're going to call that function unify. And it takes two arguments, uh, and those are going to be the two values we want to unify. And it returns one substitution, and that's the unifying substitution that when applied to a and b, it uh, gives the same result. That's the guarantee that the unify function gives us. But as we saw from the last two examples, it might not be possible to find a unifying substitution because one doesn't exist. And also sometimes we'll want to restrict the unifying substitutions that we find to be finite, and one of those might not exist as well. Uh, so in that case, maybe this, this function doesn't return anything or throws an error or something like that. Thanks for watching this video on unifying substitutions. In the next video, we're going to look at how this applies to type systems more specifically. Um, and then we're also going to go on to look at the algorithm. See you in the next one.